Okay, guys, welcome to episode two of Radio Podcasts. In this podcast, we interviewed Mr. Mark Turpin, our drama teacher, um, and he told us all about his life. And I have to say that I made one mistake. Uh, we were talking about Francis Scott Key and Fort Sumter, but it was actually Fort McHenry, if anybody cares out there. Um, it was the War of 1812, not the Civil War. So sorry about that for you history buffs. Um, we have Jessen here from Me to We and Student Council. We've also got Shagan again. Hi, Shagan. Hey. And Vinny, our logo creator. If you guys <laughs> love the logo for Radio Podcast, he's the one who made it. So, Jessen, can you update Hi. us on what's going on? Um, so... We don't have very much going on in the next week. Um, oh, that's nice. The, yeah, the, the <laughs> most major thing that we've got going on is uh, We Are Silent. It's basically a campaign um, by the Meet a We Committee um, by Free the Children. And um, basically what happens is for a $5 minimum donation, you're allowed to stay silent for the entire school day. Um, you collect your pledge form at the office, and then you hand it in to the office when you're done collecting your money. And um, all the money will go to a good cause, and the reason you're staying silent, um, you can determine that yourself, but this year our chosen cause is for child soldiers. Um, so basically, child soldiers have to give up their rights um, and freedoms, and they're forced to fight in wars for adults, which is not fair, um, and basically their voices are taken away from them. So that's what we're focusing on this year. Excellent. Yeah. Um, anything else happening for, for Student Council or Me to We or any other clubs at the school? Um, for Me to We also, we've got candy cane grams coming up. Um, we're starting our sales on November 30th. Um, basically, the candy cane grams, it, what happens is uh, for a small donation, usually it's a dollar um, to a dollar fifty each. Uh, you basically buy a candy cane gram for your friends, family, um, teachers, significant others. Um, and you get to write a little message for them, and we'll deliver it to them on the last day of school before winter break. Thank you, Jeshin. Yes. And guess what? We are planning for the Christmas assembly, so we're getting together next week to talk about it. We've got a, a, a theme this year. It's going to be, uh, that's Mr. Turpin's idea, I believe, at the last meeting, right? Yeah. Um, no, it was Shivy's idea, actually. Shivy's idea. Yeah. He came up with the whole... Um, Anyways, Mr. Turpin's going to be helping us out with that, and he's the person we interviewed, so maybe you can get some insight into what he's all about. Um, there's somebody hammering outside. What's going on? It's like a, either it's a gigantic woodpecker or somebody's <laughs> actually building something back there. We've got to find quieter rooms for this podcast. Anyways, here's Mr. Turpin. Thank you guys for, for coming to the podcast. Thank High you. fives. going good sir and yourself i'm doing well uh today we have mark turpin our drama teacher can i call you mark or is that like, yeah you can call me mark it's fine it's like your secret identity no 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 revealed. no well it's funny because i took over for mark labor day yes that's right so the students all get a kick out of the fact that the next english drama teacher is mark <laughs> it's like yeah no it has to stay in the capable hands of a mark it's kind of like uh, like James Bond, right? You, you've got changing James Bonds. Yep, different yeah, actors, different but... different people. Yeah, I wonder how they're going to handle that. Like, is James Bond the code name, or is that? I don't know. You and, know? and you know, as the movies go forward, time has also changed. You That's know, the, true. the new Bond movies take place in the modern era, but now you know, James Bond is a different actor. But I wonder, I wonder if James Bond is a code name. Yeah, I mean, 007 is meant to be the code name, but. Right. Yeah. So do you do you watch those types of movies? What kind of movies are you into? Um, I really like historical drama. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like James Bond. I haven't seen Spectre or Skyfall yet, mm -hmm. but I saw Casino Royale. Loved it. Oh yeah, and I, I think that was probably my favorite one of the Daniel Craig. Oh, era. definitely, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I mean, actually, I, you know, I can't say it because I haven't seen Skyfall yet. But uh, I've heard Spectre is so so. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Heard it wasn't very good. But the most recent movie that I saw in theaters that I really liked was Bridge of Spies, oh. the Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg film. 
takes place in 1960, based on a true story, of a U-2 spy plane that got shot down over the Soviet Union, and then that American was taken prisoner. At the same time, the Americans had a Russian spy in custody, and they decided to trade. Oh, no way. Okay. Spy for a spy. Yeah? Which, such a good film. Yeah. Such a good film. And because I like it because it's based on a true story. I like the historical dramas. I've never heard of that one. Spielberg? Spielberg. Hanks, really? Yeah, Spielberg directed it. Tom Hanks is the star. And it's pretty recent? Very re- I just saw it on Remembrance Day. I went no way. took in a film. It's super good. If you have a chance, I, I recommend will. it. Yeah. I will. So let's let's talk a little bit about you. Like, um, oh. I mean, you came to our school, mm-hmm. guns a blazing. I mean, you're, I hope I, they're I, still a blazing. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'm not wrong in describing you as somebody who just likes to take chances and Absolutely. go with the flow yeah, and yeah. say yes to opportunities and yeah. see what happens. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm not one to turn down opportunities, and th- that could be to a fault. I'm a bit of a yes man. So if someone <laughs> asks me something, oh yeah, no, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. And uh, you know, sometimes I overcommit myself, but. Again, I mean, that's only that's only my problem. It's not a problem for anybody else. Um, yeah, this is my first year teaching. I graduated from UBC in August. So August 14th was my last day of classes. And I got hired for this job uh, right away, which is thrilling. Not many teachers get uh, hired right out of school, especially into a, a position like this one. So I'm, I'm thrilled. Yeah. Thrilled to be here. And I want to make the most of this opportunity. Cause I'd love to stick around. I'm yeah. loving it already. You know, We'd we're, love to keep you. Yeah, well, love being here. Love being here. The staff and students are great. W's got such a great community, and yeah. it, it's it's not hard to come into a place like this. Guns a blazing. I want to do everything because right. I want to be involved. I want to I want to be as involved as I can. Yeah. Well, Deborah Hansen just joined us. Deborah, can I use your first name? Do you mind? You may. I was just asking Mark, and Absolutely. I used his first name. I was like, am I revealing anything? No, that's no. fine. You can use my first name. So, Deborah, if you want to be my sidekick, <laughs> you're going to have to show up on time. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. I was looking for my grade 8 girls basketball team. They Couldn't find them. They went missing? They went missing. No I don't know where they went. Okay. They weren't in the gym? No, I found the basketballs, but not the girls. Oh, interesting. So interesting. Interesting predicament. We'll see what happened to them. Um, so, so, Mark, hmm. what is your acting experience? Uh, primarily musical theater. Uh, I graduated from high school in 2003. I went right to Cap College at the time. Now it's Cap University. And I did their two-year acting diploma program. And I'm, I know the Delview students are going to be listening to this, so I'm not afraid to say what comes next. I failed a course in Ooh. college. <gasps> so Shitty. I know, I know. It, and... <laughs> It was the stupidest reason why, and let this be a warning, students. <laughs> I was doing really well in the class. I was totally getting the concepts. The one thing, I didn't hand in my final assignment. Oh, no. Because I just chose not to do it. Uh-huh. Thus, I received a failing grade. So, in order to finish my diploma, I had to go back and repeat that one course. And I figured, if I'm going back for a semester anyways, why don't I make a meal out of it? And the CAP Theatre Program had an optional one-year tack-on, which is a full-time course load, and it was a complete program in directing for the stage. So I thought, well, if I'm coming back for this one course anyways, I might as well take that. So I did a whole year of just directing. And from there, I kind of fell in love with working on that side of the table as well. So I'd done all this theatre acting, and now I'm on the other side of the table. And then out of the blue one day, after I had uh, graduated... I get a telephone call from a person who was in my class as an actor, and she had gone on to SFU to do her Bachelor of Fine Arts, and she uh, said, you ever consider teaching? And I said, well, I hadn't, but she's like, I'm, I'm looking for someone to help me out with teaching at this little academy in Coquitlam where I choreograph musical theater, and because you've directed, would you like to work with youth? And I said, yeah, yeah, that would be fun. So I started in September of 2008, teaching this little youth ensemble and absolutely fell in love with teaching, fell in love with her, and she's now gone on to be my wife. So I work with my wife on uh, Saturdays. We code, she choreographs and I direct a youth theater ensemble out in Coquitlam. And I just absolutely fell in love with teaching. So I decided to go back to university. I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in SFU. Um, then I moved to UBC and did my... Um, my B.Ed. 
all in amongst that, I have worked with Theater Under the Stars, Royal City Musical Theater, Metro Theater, Applause Musicals, Footlight Theater, um, in performing roles, directorial roles, uh, done you know a dozen musicals. I also spent a great deal of time working at the Vancouver Aquarium as an interpreter, not a language interpreter, but a like whale interpreter. interpreter. Yeah. yeah, so I was yeah, so I was the the guy on the microphone that was doing all the talking about the animals. Do you translate like whale speak. Ah! <laughs> yeah, the whale's happy. No, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Um and that could uh, be something. Yeah, it could yeah, it could be. Yeah, the the whale whisperer. Um then I worked at the Gulf of Georgia Cannery National Historic Site as a guide there as well. And I still although we're taking the winter off, I work for a company called Forbidden Vancouver and we deliver walking tours through the city. The tour that I deliver is called The Lost Souls of Gastown. And these are historically accurate tours, but they're delivered in character. So I play a role, and when you come on the tour, you, you're you told where and when to meet, and then that's, I that's show up. That kind of sounds like one of those ghost tours. It's the similar. Lost it's, Souls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grave Tales yeah. Uh, Fort Langley. Oh, similar. Yeah. And as yeah, a matter yeah. of fact, the gentleman who wrote Grave Tales at Fort Langley also works for our company. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My sister runs them. Oh, really? Or does them. Oh, cool. Oh, really? Right on. Uh, she probably then knows Amin Johal, who's Absolutely. who works for Forbidden Vancouver as well, delivering. Uh... So she does the writing. Like... No, she gives the tours. She delivers oh, okay. the tours. Yeah. Nice in character. Yeah. Hold on, I think I know your oh. sister. Is she a redhead? Uh, not recently. Not recently. Okay. <laughs> I I could have sworn I knew a Hanson that worked at Fort Langley. What's her first name? Krista. Krista. No, that doesn't ring a bell. Huh. Hmm. So your character, you were telling me. Had an accent and came from the states. Yeah, like um, so that's why I have that southern drawl done so well. <laughs> so my boss, who owns that company, he immigrated to Canada from England, and uh, he's a, trained as a as an accountant. He actually got transferred from the London office of Deloitte to Vancouver. Um, and when he got here, he realized, oh, there's a real niche market that's missing. A great historical city, but no character-driven walking tour. So he started his own company. And going through the history of Vancouver, unless you were First Nations, everybody that came here is an immigrant from somewhere. So when he delivers the tour, he delivers it as if he's from England. Well, perfect. He has an English accent already. He's good to go. But he told me, he's like, you need to be from somewhere else. It doesn't matter where, just somewhere else. And at the time that I got hired, I was working on uh, a, a pretty large-scale production of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. Oh, nice. And I was playing Judd, who's the antagonist in that story, and I kind of had this deep southern drawl in Oklahoma going on. So I was working with that, and uh, I used to... Then I thought, well, I, I know that my accent isn't from Oklahoma, so I started trying to peg where the accent that I was doing was really coming from for this walking tour. And I thought I was getting pretty close to Missouri, so I used to tell people I came from Missouri, and then I had a group of people from Missouri come on the tour that said, oh, your accent's great, your accent's great, but it's not from Missouri. I said, where's it from? And they said, it's closer to a Tennessee accent. So then I took that off-season to research Tennessee, found a little town in Tennessee called Jackson, which is on the west side of Tennessee, and it was uh, bombed very heavily by the Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. Mm-hmm. So the character that I play moved to Vancouver, uh, well, to the Vancouver area in 1862 when gold was found in the Fraser Canyon. So I'm thinking, okay, well, why why would you leave Tennessee in 1862? Well, that was the year that the Confederate so military awesome. blew the railway station up in Jackson. So I thought, okay, this is perfect. So I got this backstory. First tour I delivered in my second season, I said I was from Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, a fellow from Tennessee comes up to me and he starts <laughs> interrogating me. And he says, why did you really come here? And I told him, I said, well... Confederate military blew up our railway station in 1862 and he goes oh and then you shut up and then my boss who was also on that tour just kind of assessing me you know your stuff yeah he said yeah. he said where did you get that from I said I did my homework <laughs> so, yeah so when when you take on acting roles like that there is a great deal of research that you you do oh absolutely right? yeah, to, yeah to really get into character yeah like what is kind of, what is your process for preparing for any role uh, well, the first thing I like to find out is where is the play set? Because mm-hmm. if you know the setting, that's going to give you an understanding of, you know, of course your geography, but also where you are in time and what are some kind of big geopolitical moments that have occurred throughout history. The first musical that I ever tackled was when I was in grade 12. I was cast in a production of Bye Bye Birdie, and one of the kind of key elements of that show 
is is um they're always talking about Ed Sullivan. So here I am in grade twelve, and I'm thinking, okay, well, what is or who is Ed Sullivan? And the first thing that I did is I went home and I started, you know, looking for Ed Sullivan. But this is in an era before YouTube. I mean, YouTube was oh, yeah, not around. So I was using uh, another kind of file sharing site. I don't think it's around anymore. Called Kazaa. Oh yes, I remember Kazaa. <laughs> yeah, and I uh, I found clips of the Ed Sullivan show, and I was watching that, and I wanted to immerse myself in the culture of the. What was it like to be? In 1960s America, what what would that feeling have been like? So I started researching, and I you know you learn all kinds of stuff about the the Kennedy assassination, the Vietnam War, and the protests that are going on. And that show is kind of a, a play on Elvis going into the military. So it's you know going a little bit to late 1950s as well. And what was it like to be an American teenager at that time? And and what did that mean? So trying to find out as much as you can about the era and about where you are geographically. What are the styles? What's the lingo? What what are people talking about? And then you start looking at your own character. Okay, who am I? And how do I fit into this? What is my social economic status? What is my character's background? How how do all those things kind of relate back to what is in the script? And how do you play those circumstances? Mm-hmm. So a lot of research goes into it. And when I was doing my undergrad in theater, I paired it with an extended minor in history. And... I think that that's a really good fit because yeah, that his, totally work. historical research is such a big part of theater. I know a lot of theater teachers pair it with English. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I'm teaching English, I didn't do an English undergrad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think history is just as important, if not even somewhat more important. Mm-hmm. How are you going to do the research for a play that you're in? And how do you find that? Because knowing what you know about preparing for a role, mm-hmm. uh, and you teach drama and English, mm-hmm. Has that helped at all in terms of what you do with the, the students in oh, that class? Well, it's interesting. I mean, this is my first kind of kick in the can teaching English. And my whole mantra going into that has been, how do you bring literature to life? Mm-hmm. And what I'm finding is more and more is I want to do more research. I want to do more. And I'm thinking to myself, no, 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 that's social studies. That's social to Get that out of your head. But it's really not. It's it's totally learning the context of the literary world that you're right. exploring. Yeah. And I know that in grade 8, you kind of do the two hand-in-hand hand with humanities. You do English and social studies. Really, the two are so closely related that you you really could do humanities all the way through, I imagine. I mean, the curriculum's not set up to do that. But doing research and, and being inside these literary worlds, they're so closely linked. Mm-hmm. And the... The literary world is a mirror for our world and vice versa. So history, politics, geography, and fiction are really, they really blend well together. Mm-hmm. No, I, I found that, uh, I think it was a uh, year before last, um, Ms. Unrug got some of the teachers and Mr. Younger as well to to <clears throat> analyze a poem. Oh, and cool. And I, I never had had done that before that was the one time but Mm -hmm. i thought that was really interesting um the different looking at the different processes of different people Mm -hmm. on how to analyze a poem like i'm very methodical and looking at like i like to get the context so i actually went into the history of the person who wrote the poem and what was going on at the time when they were writing it because i i have this feeling that you know the situation motivates you to do certain things, right? Absolutely. Um, whereas other people would take the poem and kind of relate it to what's happened to them without any research. I, you know, there's different ways of approaching art. Oh, but 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 I absolutely. guess you know it would work really well to um, dive into the history and the context of the time when you're dealing with something like an acting role or even a fictional character mm-hmm. uh, in a, a book or whatever. Um, there's a lot of rich stuff you could do with the kids and and finding out the author's journey as well like you said that's so Mm -hmm. important why is the author writing this at this point in time what's what's their inspiration and what you find is that the reason why they're inspired often comes through in their writing anyways so going back and learning about the author it's key absolutely that's the way that i look at it as well Coming from a, a historical perspective, I know a lot of people, especially with poetry, they try to relate the poem to their own life. Right. Oh, what is this speaking to me and what is this saying to me? Mm-hmm. And while that's completely valid and, and intentional, I also like to think, what was the poet's intention? 
Right. And even if I can't figure out exactly what it was, you can gain hints by going back through the history and, you yeah. know, where yeah. are they? Where are they in time? Why are they writing this? Yeah. What, one poem in particular that sticks out in my mind just because it, we've recently passed it is Remembrance Day in Flanders Fields by uh, John McRae. Right. The context behind the writing of that, I mean, it's a beautiful poem, but what did John McRae have to witness in order to write that? Mm -hmm. I often think about that, and we'll never know anymore, but uh, what would it have been like to be able to ask, where where was your mind when you wrote this? Right. Or Francis Scott Key with the American National Anthem. You yeah. Know, sitting in a, was it in a jail cell that he was in, watching... Um, the fireworks yeah, yeah, yeah. of the, the battle that was going on. Uh, um, trying to remember it, exactly where that was. was. Was that Fort Sumter? Yes, it was. Yeah. Fort Sumter. Yeah. 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 Which was the start of the American Civil War. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's always interesting when you dive deeper and look into the stories. I have, obviously, I have an in interest in history. Mm -hmm. um, so I often take something like that and off I go into the internet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, five hours later. Oh, uh, where, where, where did the time go? Sleep? No, I do the same thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know that you have a, a big love of jazz music. Oh, yes. we, We've talked about this. And oftentimes, I mean, my kind of my favorite era in the 20th century is the um, roaring 20s up and through the Second World War. And whenever I'm doing research on that, I, I just love to immerse myself in everything that was in that culture, including right. the big band music of the time and some of the artists that came out of that. The the Glenn Millers, the, the Benny Goodmans, the... Satchmo, Ella Fitzgerald, I know they get a little bit later on as well, mm -hmm. Billie Holiday, mm -hmm. um, there was one time, actually it was really funny, when I was uh, I was in grade 12, and uh, this is back in the day when you would still go buy CDs from Virgin Records at Broadway, and or, or sorry, Berard and uh, Robson, and I didn't have a driver's license, I said to my mom, I want to go buy a CD, and she said, what do you want to buy, and she drove me down there, and I bought a two disc set of Fred Astaire, singing nice. and tap dancing and, and she's like I couldn't believe it my my 17 year old son wanted to go downtown to buy a CD of Fred Astaire tap dancing and I love it <laughs> sounds great oh it's so good so, so how, how did you get into jazz because that's not like you when you talk to people and music and they're how they get into something I, I don't usually hear jazz from other people that's why when I talk to mm -hmm. you at the, at the staff event it's like you like jazz too it's like mm -hmm. a it's like a miracle so how did how did you get into that um, genre? It's interesting. I it's it's really hard to say. I mean, my parents had kids quite late in life. I was born when my parents were forty, mm -hmm. so I I lost my grandparents quite early in my life. I was six when I lost my grandfather. I was ten when I lost my grandmother on my mom's side, and about fourteen when I lost my other grandmother. And I, there was one grandfather I never even met. And I just remember whenever my parents would go out to social functions, I was always babysat by one of my grandmothers, on, the grandmother on my dad's side. And she used to love watching television shows like Lawrence Welk. Right. My and, grandparents too. Maybe yeah, that's, that's yeah. how I got and then And then whenever we were driving home from there, and she used to live uh, way out kind of in the Dunbar area of Vancouver. I lived in Coquitlam. So my parents would always have CKW on. And at that time of night, Jack Cullen and the Owl Prowl would would be the radio show that was playing and it was all this old jazz music right. and I just remember being so comforted and so soothed by that music and I I I don't know if it was anything in particular that my parents did but I grew up with this kind of upbringing of really honoring family tradition and and honoring the history of my family and I always just found that what my family was doing in, in that era. Both my grandparents served in the Second World War. There's just something really honorable about that generation, and I just loved that music. And then I was in, in grade 10, and I had gone to a small little private school uh, for grade 7, 8, and 9 because my grades slipped in grade 6, and I started hanging out with the wrong people. So my parents put me in private school, and in order to go back to public school, I had to earn it. So I got my grades up, and, and I went back to public school and was able to take high school band. No and uh, I, I wasn't doing very well in band because I didn't have any music from grades 7, 8, 9. The private school I went to was 120 students, kindergarten to grade 12. It's a very small school with no electives. It, it, was, uh, it was challenging. So when I went back to, to high school, I, I wanted to do all these electives that I didn't have, and I didn't have any experience with band. 
And uh, I was actually brought into a parent-teacher interview with my music teacher and my parents, and I was told that I was going to fail band unless I did something about it. So I didn't want to fail any courses, and, and at that time I kind of decided to go in on lunch hours and spend some time with my band teacher and playing my instrument, learning the music. When I started grade 11, I got invited to join the choir. And that really brought up my music skills. And I found that I enjoyed singing so much that I clawed my way into our vocal jazz ensemble in grade 11. And that was a kind of a smaller elite group. And then in grade 12, I auditioned for and was accepted into the BC Provincial Honors Vocal Jazz Ensemble. So I got to sing at, at a very, very high level with an American director who was brought in for, uh, for this honors group. And it, was, it, it felt really prestigious. I felt like, oh, I'm one of the top 16 high school jazz vocalists in the province. This is great. And I just love jazz music. Mm-hmm. And when the Glenn Miller Band comes into town now and they still tour, yeah. that's always like a mother son date for me. They, I always... they don't have any original members. Though. No original <laughs> members, no. But they're playing the original charts, right. which is cool. Yeah. So all the arrangements are exactly... And um, coincidentally, there was a gentleman who uh, played in the orchestra for a production of 42nd Street that I was in, a very, very good trumpet player. And the last time the Glenn Miller Band came into town, I noticed that he was on stage. So I Facebooked him when I got home. I said, Chris, I saw you in, in the Glenn Miller band. What's up? Like, are you touring with them now? And he Facebooked me back and he's like, no, um, but one of their horn players had trouble getting across the border. I don't know what the issue was at Customs. But when they came into town, they were short a horn wow. player, so they had to find a local one. His name got recommended. And I said, wow, you did a great job. And he was soloing and doing yeah. all this kind of stuff. And he said, the music was the hardest thing in the world to read because all the charts are originally... And he says, it's like when you when you pull it out of the folder, it's like you're holding a, a museum relic. And you think the original, that, the original charts. Music. Yeah, he's like, you feel like it's going to fall apart and you no can't way. read it because it's all faded. <laughs> and and he, he says it's unreal to play that music because they're all the original charts. That must have been pretty cool for him to be called up. Oh, like, yeah. 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 You, you just dream about that kind of stuff, I know, right? yeah. Hockey team comes to town, maybe they'll call me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Willie Desjardins called me. I'm going to play for the Canucks tonight. I was like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, but he was excellent, and and it was just it was really neat to see that connection. Was, you know, I, I hold the Glenn Miller band in such high regard, and then I'm thinking, he was in the orchestra of a musical that I was in. You know, like six degrees of separation. It was like, hey, you know. Wow. Yeah. So, similar to you, now I'm finding more connections between us. Ah. Um, with the Lawrence Welk. Yeah. Which, you have to admit, it was kind of a square show. Oh, it totally was. was. Yeah. Kind yeah. of, you know, square. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the skits were not Lame. super funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I used to watch that a lot with my grandparents. Yeah. And that was, like, their favorite show. Every time I would go yeah. to the place for babysitting, yeah. they would make me watch it. And, you know, maybe I got some influences there. But I also played in the, the school band. When I got to grade 7, we had to we had a band program there. So mm-hmm. I started playing trumpet. Right on. Up, up until grade 10. And then senior high, we didn't, really didn't have much of a band, so yeah. we kind of dropped out there. Also yeah. joined the jazz choir. Right on. Not to the same extent that you did with the, with what you did with it. Um, not to that high of a degree, but, you know, I just love the music. And oh, so I still good. play sometimes on the piano. Oh, right on. Um, trying to figure out improvisation. That's not really, because I'm classically trained, I guess, yeah. and it's, it's hard for me to figure that out. So I'm, I'm trying to get some tips or pointers as, as to how to improvise yeah. in jazz because it's a different thing improvise on the piano you mean on the piano yeah I, I my biggest regret in life and they say don't live life with regrets and I try not to but if I can have one regret it's quitting piano lessons why did you quit? Uh, I probably started piano lessons when I was about 7 years old and I quit when I was about 10 Okay. And the reason why I quit is because I was getting really involved in soccer, and I was right. a very competitive soccer player all through high school. Um, soccer, although it was fun, it kept me in great shape. I really enjoyed it. I really liked being part of a team. I still loved the sport. It, it, other than that, it really got me nowhere. Like, at the yeah. end of the day, you know, here I am. I, I stopped playing soccer when I was 18. Ten years later, what has that done for me? Mm-hmm. But if I had stuck with the piano with my musical theater training... I just think, oh, how amazing could it be if I could play the piano well, and direct it? And... I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's never too late. No, I know, I know. It's <laughs> true. I mean, you played for three years, so you have a 
I mean, I mean, I can I can read music yeah. and and I can play a melody line with my right hand almost no problem. Yeah. The problem for me is adding the left hand yeah. and then sight reading a clump of notes. Right. And and how do you go from clump of notes to clump of notes? Ugh. I mean, right. to me, it it almost feels like learning another language. And they say that that's much easier when you're younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was going through high school, I w- I was fortunate slash unfortunate that I went through high school in an era when you only really needed a language up to grade nine if you intended to go to university and I never did I wanted to go to college first so after grade nine I never took a language and all of my French is completely gone and now just the idea of learning another language seems incomprehensible to me Mm -hmm. I I can't even fathom what it would be like at my age to try and learn another language I have enough problems with English as it is (laughs) You know? Confusing, strange language. Yeah. Language, yeah. Always possible. <laughs> <laughs> Says the trilingual, uh, well, you know, trilingual Deborah. Language. I mean, but if I ever was to learn another language, German would be the one I'd love to learn. I think it's it's an interesting language. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I love the sound of it. A lot of people think it sounds so harsh, but I no, think there's it's so pretty. yeah, I think there's something very there's beautiful enough. about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll teach you. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Sounds teach good. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I would love to learn how to speak German. She needs a side job anyway. There you yeah, go. I yeah. Don't don't have enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, so now what is coming up for you? you I mean, you're, you're obviously into the, the program now here mm-hmm. at school. So what kind of things have you got planned for our drama productions? And uh, We're going to put on two plays this year, which sounds really ambitious. Uh, it's a lot less ambitious when I tell you that I, I'm not directing both of them. Mm. Uh, I have some really committed script writing directing students this year. Uh, in um, Kayla Amaral and Alyssa Brooke. And they have spent uh, all of September and October writing a one-act play. And it's actually really good. I'm really proud of them. And just this week, so uh, today is Wednesday, we started rehearsals on Monday. And those two have written their own script, and now they're directing the play. They held auditions uh, for the last two weeks, and they've cast their show. I'm overseeing it so I'm, I'm kind of shadowing them and mentoring them along the way but they're they're putting on the show from scratch which is going to be really really cool so that play will go up in january yeah. uh keep your eyes out for information we're setting our performance dates kind of right now uh and then right about the time when that play is performing i'm going to start auditioning for our spring main stage play uh which will also be in the studio we're going to do our plays in the studio this year which i think is going to be really fun and uh although i have something in mind I'm not at liberty to share until I get the approval from administration. Is it a musical? It's not a musical, no. Um, um, although I would love to direct a musical here, and uh, God willing I stay here, the musical will be next year. Uh-huh. Um, in trying to learn a little bit about the culture of the school, and, and I did have a great opportunity to, to uh, meet with Mr. Laborde, who was the previous drama teacher here. The culture that he was trying to instill in the school is that you do a musical every other year. So last year, a very successful run of uh, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman's Little Shop of Horrors yes. means that this year would be a non-musical year and yeah. then uh, tackle the musical next year. Because they're hard to do. They're hard to, they are hard to do. And yeah. like, I think we did try with, a, with Greece with a live band before. Oh, that's, cool. That's even more difficult. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they get the band to the caliber where they can actually... Yeah play live absolutely while things are going on yeah. on stage is totally different it's 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 like trying to juggle 18 things that are on fire yeah it's it like it really you're using a part of your brain that is multitasking everything and it's not just one person that has to multitask everything it's everybody and mm-hmm. everybody has to be on the same page you need to have a set that works that's movable you need to have a director that's willing to take the time to worry about the acting and unify a concept between the dancing and the music. Then you have a musical director who can both direct the vocalists on stage acting and telling a story through a song, as well as a band that needs to keep time and rhythm and keep the mood. Then you have a choreographer who needs to find out how to tell the story through movement. And and then you got to light it, you got to costume it, you got to add props... I saw um, Thoroughly Modern Millie mm-hmm. at Crofton House once. Oh, cool. Because uh, my wife was working there for like a TOC job there. Mm-hmm. And they had a live band. Mm-hmm. They had the tap dancing. Cool. They had the choreography, the singing. And, and not everything was completely refined. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it was just amazing that you could 
put all those elements together and just like make it work decently. Oh, totally. I was I was astounded. When when so, was that? Do you remember? Oh, that was uh, maybe five years ago, five or six years ago. You wouldn't you wouldn't happen to remember the name of the music teacher there, would you? No. Oh, okay. No. Because there's a gentleman that I worked with a number of years ago by the name of Spencer Bach. And uh, I always thought it was funny that his name is Bach, and it's spelled the same way as the mm. the old composer. Um, and he's a music teacher and a musical theater connoisseur at an all-girls school. And I can't remember if it's Crofton or York House, or maybe Little Flower. One of those three, of course. Those are the three all-girls schools. Mm. Now, is it true that at a school like Crofton House, which is an all-girls school, they pair up with an all-boys school to they cast did. their shows? Yes, yes they did. Um, because they needed, they had some male roles. Of obviously. course. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So they... I think it paired up with uh, St. George. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about so right. St. George's came and uh, and some of the members of the band were male as well. Oh, right on. That's cool. Yeah, so it was a real collaboration. And, and adding that too, that's kind of like how do you... Yeah, work, work at working it's, between two schools to put yeah. on this production. And yeah. Mind you, it's two private schools that both have a lot of money. Yeah. It'd be nice to have that budget, yeah. right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And uh, Yeah, they brought in like a tap dance coach and oh, right that on. Kind of stuff. So they yeah, had yeah. special people brought in. Now, but I'll De- take care of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Deborah's a dancer. You are? I am. I didn't know. Can yeah. you, can like, oh, this, this is not the not right floor for flooring. it. Not ideal Do you do tap? Uh, yes. You do tap? Not any, not so much anymore tap dance. I still uh-huh. do some other ones, but tap is my favorite. I love it. Yeah. yeah I love competed tap. competed for lots of years. Yeah. Spent a long time. That's that's something I wish I knew how to do. Like, I got into dancing late when I got to UBC. Again, with the jazz music, music and loving that, uh, I joined the swing Swing dancing. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> awesome. So this was, like, I think this was in 99, I'd like to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and me and a bunch of friends did lessons, and it was kind of the neo-swing era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like oh. Colin James and... Um, um, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. That's, yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. All these all these bands started coming out of nowhere. Yeah. And then uh, every Saturday night, we would go to the... the um, what's that called? The... Uh, for veterans, the... Uh, the Legion. The Legion. <laughs> On commercial drive, yep. we'd go to the Legion, and it was good. It was, it was a cool vibe. You, you you went in, paid your ticket. It was like a couple bucks, yeah. maybe five bucks. But you would go in, and then they would do a, a lesson at the beginning That's of awesome. some sort of dance, and then they'd just play music all night long, with the, and the DJ was great. Cool. And then in the middle of, like, halfway through, they would have, like, a dance circle, so all the... All the like much better dancers than I was. They would do their Lindy Hop, like the, the oh you know, yeah 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 all the uh, flips and yeah, things yeah. like that. That's so cool. It was That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Do they still do that? I don't know. Huh. I don't know if they, it's been a long time. Yeah. Because we used to go there. Every, I swear, every Saturday night, that was kind That's of cool. our, our thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then it, it seemed like it kind of died down because those those bands don't seem to be around anymore. But um, maybe. History does a, tend to repeat itself. I think yeah. it'll it'll make a comeback again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the two tone shoes. I and... have a pair of two tone shoes. I know. I saw them. I wore them on you formal day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I was looking for those for so long, and they were a Christmas gift for my wife last year. Nice. And uh, I've only worn them indoors. I don't wear them outdoors. No, you don't want special to, shoes. Yeah, those are special shoes. Are they for dance? Like no, they... no, no, no. I mean, I guess they could be. I mean, anything technically could be. Um, they're not proper dance shoes, though. They're they're Howard Johnston. Which is uh, American like the hotel chain? <laughs> no, maybe no, no. Maybe I'm thinking it wrong. Howard, no, not Howard Johnson. They're uh, Johnston and Johnston. Oh, Johnson I'm forgetting Johnson. No, no, I'm forgetting <laughs> the name now. It's a uh, it's a shoe brand. It's an American puppies. shoe brand. No, no, no. I'm gonna look this up. I'm gonna look this up because we have the technology, the the old iPhone technology here. What kind of shoes do you wear, Deborah? <laughs> I'm wearing Keds right now. Keds, those <laughs> not are not. Great for those are not dancing they shoes. They are not dancing shoes. So you have tap shoes. Johnson and Murphy. <laughs> Johnson and Murphy. Johnson and Murphy. Yeah, that's an American shoe brand, uh, high end. High end. High end. She didn't. T- it was None yeah, of the so- cheap stuff from China. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a lot of good stuff comes out of China too. But uh, <laughs> I guess we can't say that anymore. You know, no, iPhones yeah. from China. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, my wife wouldn't tell me how much she spent on them, but I'm pretty sure it was like 
probably around about 170 to 200 dollars, which is a lot more money than I usually pay for a pair of shoes. So they're you should. indoor shoes. They're indoor <laughs> shoes. You need to look for that Legion because yeah, yeah, people used to dress up for that. Uh, it's just the, the spectacle. The pinstripe suits. And yeah, like, I never had any of that stuff, no. but uh, like the the pro dancers yeah. were there with their pinstripe suits and, and the double breasted jackets. Yeah, all of that. Oh, that's cool. It was just amazing to see them whiz around and you know swing nightclubs aren't what they used to be you know like a nightclub today is the kind of place where you go and and spend way too much money on beverages that you don't need to pay money for and you listen to a dj pump out this music but like going to a nightclub you know back in the 30s and 40s used to be all about getting dressed up and and listening to a live band and having a dance floor and the food was good too at some of these higher end nightclubs and it used to be something, a place to see and be seen. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to be seen in a nightclub these days. <laughs> Embarrassing. I think I, we're, we're like old folks. I know. <laughs> I know. I thought about that. It's like, I, I can't remember the last time I went to a nightclub. I don't even bother anymore. But so, if they had one that was swing music and, and really cool live band where you got dressed up formal. Oh, yeah. We should look for that. I'd go. I'm sure there's, there's got to be something be going something. on. There must so. be something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there, there used to be a, a few places that had that going on. There like was that. one on Granville Street, and it used to be called Babalu. And I, I don't know what it turned into, but that's where Michael Bublé got his start. Really? Yeah. Singing crooner tunes nice. at a jazz nightclub in Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. Babalu. Bublé. Uh, the last time I saw him... Um, I think he stole my spot at Granville Island. What? No, I totally. I was, <laughs> really? Like your parking spot? <clears throat> my parking spot. Oh. Because he, he pulled in, yeah. like, I swear it was my spot, and then this car came, in, or it was an SUV came in from nowhere. Yeah, I think yeah. he was with his mom or something like that, uh, an yeah. older woman. Yeah. But I was like, oh, that's Michael Bublé. He stole my spot. <laughs> yeah. He's human just like everybody else, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, he thinks he's not. He goes and steals your spot. That wasn't very nice. Did he at least apologize for it? No. No. Get a no. wave, anything? No. I still listen to his music, though. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty darn good. You know what, you know what, though? He's a smoker. Smoker, as in, like, like, like literally Yeah, smoker. like cigarettes. Okay. That surprises me. Because, Does it? Yeah. I mean, I guess... Your throat? Yeah, because it's, it's not good for a singing voice to be a smoker. What? It's not good for cancer either. Yeah, no, no. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, many things, but you know, singers are usually all about preserving their voice and what can I do to maintain vocal health. Yeah. But I guess you know, when you think about it, the guys like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. they all smoked. So maybe it's just part of the culture of that kind of music where you maybe. want that smoky sound. Maybe. But does it add to your sound? I you don't think? think it does. I mean, if you listen to old Frank Sinatra, yeah, versus. You know, Frank Sinatra from the 80s and 90s, right before he passed away, you hear a totally different singer. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a great recording of Frank Sinatra singing a song, I'll Be Seeing You, uh, in the 1940s, during the Second World War. And if, if someone didn't tell you it was Frank Sinatra, you wouldn't know, because he was so young, and his voice was so smooth pure, and, and so yeah. smooth, and it, it, it's no wonder he became who he became, because his voice is beautiful, but when you listen to him later in his career, even a decade later when he's singing you know, hits like Come Fly With Me, you can hear just a, a, a hint of rasp. However, I think that in order to be a successful singer, you kind of have to have that characteristic voice, yeah. right? It's not just, yeah. no, it's not just the fact that you can sing well, because there's tons of really famous or popular artists that mm -hmm. just don't sing well. Yeah. Um, you also have to have that kind of, um, that characteristic yeah, that, in that your voice. Yeah, that factor. Where people can, like Billie Holiday, like oh. when you listen, you know, yeah. that, oh, that's Billie Holiday, yeah. that's Ella, yeah. or whoever, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but when guys like Frank and Dino... Were, were doing their thing, smoking was just such a common part of culture. Yeah. Everybody smoked. And yeah. there was little to no health concern at that point in time. And it was mm -hmm. just part of, it was almost part of fashion. Yeah. Like it was, yeah. a, it was almost like a fashion accessory to have a cigarette. Right. Be and they just didn't know better yeah. as well. No, it's right? true. It's totally yeah. true. But knowing what we know now, it, it surprises me that Michael Bublé, and there are, there are a number of other singers that are smokers. Katy Perry smokes. Mm -hmm. Rihanna smokes. You keep track of this stuff, huh? I, I came across a, These are the singers who <laughs> oh, smoke. I came, up, get, I came across the top a, ten list. Of it was a buzz, smoke? Buzzfeed. Oh gosh! People that you wouldn't believe that smoke. Oh. 
There's yeah. so many lists out there. I can't I, believe it. Every time you know you check Facebook, there's like top ten reasons, blah blah blah. Yeah, top, and it, it basically you click on it, and there's a whole bunch of ads that I know that surround the list. Yeah, yeah, and and they're uploading viruses to your computer, and then your they're, computer slows down. Yeah, and, but they've got you because somehow I guess people. People obviously love lists. I love lists. Or, or I guess it's. I guess we're in. Um, yeah, right now, where where people are into reading headlines, right? They just oh, yeah. want the short story. Yeah. Um, and move on to the next thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that's well, what Facebook and Twitter. They know how many things to expect, so they right. know how long till the end of the article. If it's right. five things. It'll be short. If it's yeah. A hundred things. Yeah. It's and I'll admit, me. I get sucked into that as well. But that's kind of how social media is built. Like 140 characters for. Twitter, yeah. keep it short, go well, through it, and, and be done and, with it. And as an English teacher, I, I am finding that this is actually having a negative impact on the youth's ability to write. Mm-hmm. The um, long-form... Long-form writing, writing. is just, it's it's gone. And the amount of times, and you know, not, not to embarrass anybody that is potentially listening to this, but the amount of times that I've been reading papers that have been submitted to me by students here, and instead of writing Y-O-U... It's just the letter U. Yeah. Like, that happens. Yeah. And it's because of social media and text messaging and trying to be uber concise. And this concision is actually ruining our language, in a way. Well, I, I see it as, uh, like, they, people need to be able to switch from mm-hmm. one form of writing to another. Because there's many different forms of writing. You'd write differently to a business in terms of a business letter than you would write like a personal letter, right? Of course. Um, and you should be able to like work complex enough where we should be able to learn each yeah. different type of writing and yeah. switch. Like I know Megan Ellis did a, a really interesting um, project last year. I think it was a like an assignment um, where she actually got the kids to write. This is social media writing. We we'll, want you to write these ideas in social media writing, and then formal writing and like so they could see like a side be side oh that's really neat. comparison and and that way they could see that okay i need to switch to yeah. this form of writing so it's i think it's a transition between the forms of writing that people might be having difficulty with i like that so much that i'm going to steal that totally. so if any of my com 11 <laughs> students are listening be prepared that's going to be an assignment we're going to do that it's fantastic i think it's a great assignment yeah. oh because totally you don't often think of it that way yeah and you you might think that the way you write or talk somewhere else belongs in this context. Yes. Yeah. No, you're totally right. Yeah. And, you know, I think I consider myself to be part of a generation that is able to go back and forth because I grew up not having it. I, I grew up in an era before, like when I was in high school, a cell phone was for making phone calls. Mm-hmm. And, and that was pretty much it. Uh, and nowadays, the phone is really more for text messaging. But being the generation that I'm in right now, we have adapted to technology very well. Whereas, say, my father's generation, he hasn't. My dad's got an iPhone for business, and he hate. Well, I shouldn't say that. He hated it at the start. He loves it now. But even when he text messages me, and I get text messages from my 70-year-old dad, and rather than it being short text message form, he writes me full <laughs> text messages. Good morning, Mark. How are you doing today? I just thought I would send you a text to find out how you're doing. Whereas, if I'm texting a friend, I could get all of that in apostrophe sup. Yeah. Hey, sup. And, and I've said that all or I need emoji, to say. Or an emoji, right? Uh, yeah, or an emoji, even. You should show him the emoji. Yeah, I know. That would freak him out. <laughs> but yeah, my dad sends me all these like long text messages and I've, uh, to say nothing. To yeah. Just I just thought I'd find out how you're doing. It's my dad. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's very funny. Nice. And I, I think there's it's something... Nice to have oh, yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, it's nice to text messages with my dad. And I'll send him something back, short for him, and he'll understand it. Yeah. But it's almost like... Um, it's like my wife. My wife's Italian. Uh, she doesn't speak Italian, but she can understand it fluently. And they call that non-phonating fluency. So she can listen to it and then translate everything that's been said to me in English, but she can't speak Italian back to her grandparents or anything. Uh-huh. It's like that with my dad. Like, he can read a modern text message and get everything, but he can't text back in text language. <laughs> he texts back in, in formal language. Called? Non-phonating fluency. Non-phonating fluency. Yeah. Oh, okay. The so... ability to comprehend and understand a language being spoken to you, but the inability to speak it back. Yeah. It's yeah. actually a psychological trait, um, and it's believed to be above anything else as a lack of confidence. Huh. You know, I he... think that's what I have. Yeah? Yeah. Because, uh, like... With Mandarin mm-hmm. and, and Cantonese to some extent, mm-hmm. I can totally understand what people are saying. I can translate it to English, mm-hmm. 
Um, but I have a lot of trouble actually speaking it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very, very common. And I think it is it is a confidence thing because mm-hmm. I, I don't like you don't I practice practice enough exactly to the extent where I, I feel confident enough to to speak up. Although, just like you, I mean, I take on the philosophy of just say yes and good things might happen. <laughs> yeah. and if not, then it's a learning yeah. uh, chance to learn, right? Yeah. So a few years back, uh, one of our administrators told me to come in and translate. Wow. <laughs> me. Um, so because, you know, I was... Translate uh, into Mandarin or uh, translate well, back this, from Mandarin? There was this um, student from, I think, from mainland China. No, from Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And his dad was in with him. And uh, the, the vice principal at that time obviously couldn't communicate with him. Mm-hmm. So me being w- one of the only ones here who, can, who could understand mm-hmm. um, Mandarin, I came in and I, I listened to what they had to say and I translated to English. But he also made me do it the other way. Oh, wow. So he, he said, okay, tell them this. And so th- somehow they understood. Wow. Like, I f- totally was faking it. Um, Fake it till you make it. Using words that I, you know, it was really hard though. Yeah. It was really difficult for me. Wow. Um, because like no practice. Yeah, yeah. I took like seven years of Chinese school. Right. And unless you, unless you're able to to talk to people at home and, mm-hmm. and do that kind of thing and get it into your your brain or just travel to another country and force yourself to do it, it just doesn't happen. Very easily lost. Yeah. yeah. Was Mandarin your first language? It was actually, and it was spoken in your household growing up. It was, yeah, 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 it was. And then when I when I got into elementary school, I guess later on in elementary school, all we spoke at home was English. Wow, yeah, it switched somehow. Hmm. And even with your parents as well. <laughs> even with my parents, wow, it became. I don't know how that happened because they yeah. they always said they tried to speak Mandarin, yeah, but. I don't know. They just slipped into the the English. Oh, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> and they're not native English speakers. Of course, obviously. yeah, yeah. yeah so. That's very interesting. I mean, a lot of the Chinese people that I know uh, will still speak either Mandarin or Cantonese at home yeah. and English at school. And, and uh, it's it's very interesting that your family switched completely to English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they did. That's what really about cool. your family? You speak perfect. German <laughs> and English and, and French. My family only speaks English. They, I'm the only one that knows the other languages, to be perfectly honest. Oh, really? My mom can speak some French, but I went through French immersion. I did that on my own. And then German I picked up in university. So I have no one to speak with. How do you just pick it up? Like, how do you, like you must be like a, a language person or <laughs> such a thing, because I don't know how you would just pick it up and... Like, so late in life? Um, University, in order to be uh, a French major, I had to be a modern language major, which means I had to choose two. So I originally chose Spanish, but the entire class was full. So then I chose Norwegian, because my cousin was a Norwegian major, and I figured she could help me. Oh, okay. And then I realized no one speaks Norwegian, except for people in Norway. They had Norwegian? They had Norwegian. What university? Um, part of the U of A, so it was small town Alberta, <laughs> about an hour south Did of Edmonton. Did they have Edmonton. like a Norwegian community? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. it's a big Norwegian community. I and see. then the last option was German, and I went, well, that sounds kind of cool. I guess I'll try that. And after the first week, they said, you know, you can switch into Spanish if you want. I said, well, German's kind of cool now, so yeah. I stuck with it. Did a semester, and now I'm teaching at Saturday morning German school. Nice. So I get my German fix on Saturday mornings. Are you fluent? I can, yeah. That's yeah, impressive. I can hold a conversation. There's obviously words I don't know, but there's words in English I don't know. Yeah, so I enough. try not to kind of let that hinder me. And how's your reading comprehension? Pretty good. Yeah. It, speaking is the hardest thing to do in any language. Yeah. Speaking mm-hmm. is usually what comes last because you want time to think about it. And then when it comes time to perform, a lot of the time... You just freeze. Yeah. You Like waiting in lineups at stores, you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to say. And then you get up there and you just kind of point and mumble something. Right. And they figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, my wife is a language person as well because she, she's a French teacher and business ed teacher. But um, Perfect. she's Japanese. <laughs> so she speaks Japanese. Mm-hmm. Somehow she kept it up. Wow. Um, but she also, like her, I think her mom spoke, mom and dad spoke Japanese at home too. So that... That helps. That helps. Um, but also, um, 
she speaks French fluently, and in high school, and as she went through French immersion, um, and then she has like a French tutor, and so she speaks fluent French as well. Mm-hmm. But she sings it, and she tried to learn Mandarin. She picks up stuff. Like I think there. Are, Once you like learn a, one, your your second. I don't know. the The next one you learn after that is a that lot works? easier. Okay. Yeah, because I did a semester in Cuba and did some Spanish, and because it's so close to French, it was pretty easy. But I went there knowing I couldn't even count or tell days of the week. I knew nothing. Right. And by the end, fully functional. Wow. Well, I mean, I could order food and hey, get my point across. But that's the most that's important. That's what I needed. That's right? the most important. So. How to order food and ask to go to the bathroom. I mean, like, where's the bathroom? That is. <laughs> yeah, like, I ordered a lot of food that I didn't know what I was going to get. It was kind of a surprise, and I'll take whatever number one was. That's hilarious. So, in terms of fluency, like she talked about being able to speak a language, like speaking is the most difficult part. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you've you've done. Some acting. Have you done mm-hmm. improv as well? I've done a little bit of improv, yeah. So how does that, how is that, how are you able to come up with things on the spot? Is there like a method to it or practice that well, you do? Well, yeah, it's to... interesting. So many people think that improv is theater with no rules. But what you find is that that can't happen. So even within improv, there is a structure and, and certain activities go certain ways and you kind of learn to really trust yourself. It, sometimes it's unfounded trust, but you have to trust yourself. And one of the rules of thumb is the first idea is the best idea. Mm-hmm. So you kind of just say what comes to your mind. Um, but again, scenes typically do have a structure. So it's not just like freedom, go ahead. Whenever you're going to do an improvisation, you always usually have a setting. So you know where you are. You're usually, but not always, given a character and what the relationship is. So, okay, so you're two guys at a at a department store. One's a salesman and one's a guy looking to buy shoes. Okay, great. So you put yourself into that situation and then you start off. And I guess if, if you're not told that, then you come up with it yourself. Right? Exactly. You have to start from yeah. somewhere. Mm-hmm. And the other, the, like the key rule to improv is always say yes and maybe that's why I'm a bit of a yes man Hmm. but as soon as like uh, improv is all about accepting offers and as soon as you turn down the offer the scene goes flat so hey do you want to buy these shoes no (laughs) the scene goes nowhere hey do you want to buy these shoes absolutely I do what are they oh well let's see they're they're these Italian loafers and they cost a thousand dollars do you have a thousand dollars Yes, I do. And and it, that's that's the funny thing about it is you watch people get into these compromising situations and that's what makes it funny is uh, yeah. how do you get you get how to do you wa- get your partner into that situation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then and then how are you going to make it work? How are you going to get yeah. out of it because uh, and sometimes an improv is like, "Okay, now now find a way to end the scene." And then how are you going to end it? How are you going to find a conclusion? And it's really easy to find conflict in improv because something always comes up and you you accept that offer that you weren't expecting. Yes. Yes. Yes, that looks great. And it, improv is really fun too when the audience gets involved. And if you've ever had an opportunity to go down to Granville Island and watch the Vancouver Theatre Sports League, they do, they do all kinds of activities like uh, a scene called Should Have Said. Uh-huh. And at any point in time, the audience gets to scream out, Should Have Said, and then the person has to rephrase <laughs> what they said. Hey, I'm going to go buy some hot dogs. Should have said Slurpees. Let's go buy Slurpees. And uh, <laughs> when the audience gets involved, it's just who knows what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you, you really have to be good at saying yes, and but thinking fast as well. You have to think really fast. And it, it, the, the truth of the matter is that improv is not for everybody. And I, although I very much appreciate it and I think it's really, really fun, I know that that's not my strength. Mm-hmm. I'll participate and I'll go watch improv and I absolutely adore it, but I know that that's not my strength as an actor. I don't know what my strength is, but I know it's not that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's surprising because, you, like Robin Williams, I, like he was totally good at just coming up with stuff out mm-hmm. of nowhere, but I remember one episode of uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway, where, where these, you know, you had your usual call of mockery and, and those guys, um, and they were there and Robin comes on and I'm like, oh, I was totally pumped for this, um, but I felt that a lot of his stuff wasn't as good as I thought it would be. Yeah. Like, maybe maybe there's something to the fact that these other uh, people there had a lot more practice and more recently. Well, and, and that's just it, like too. That. It's it's like a muscle, right? Yeah. And um, 
you know, if you're a soccer player and you're kicking the ball every single day, your shot's going to be a lot harder and a lot more accurate than a player who hasn't played in 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing too, and, and again, to use professional sports as an analogy, even actors have off days. Yeah. And and it could just be that at that particular moment, you know, if Robin Williams hadn't done a lot of improvisation for a while and could have just been having a bad day, a combination of these things, and, and it can totally happen where scenes just fall flat. Mm-hmm. And what do you do, right? It's it's hard. Yeah. And another thing, too, that uh, I think a lot of people take for granted, especially not just with improvisation but with all live theater, is how much of a role and a responsibility an audience plays in that relationship. It's so much different from film because film is always going to be what it's going to be and the audience is going to take what they get from it. But there is a relationship. There's something that goes on between the audience and the actors on stage. And Even in scripted theater. Even in scripted theater, absolutely. The energy. Yeah, the audience response to things totally feeds the energy of a cast. And I, I was one time told to always appreciate every audience no matter what because a lot of people used to come out off stage after a scene and be like wow that's a bad audience tonight mm-hmm. no, no 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 they're here they're watching they're just not laughing as loud or they're not responding in a way that you were hoping to but you can never call them a bad audience but although we're, t- we're taught to never say it's a bad audience you can have a great audience and there are some nights when, when they're laughing at everything. They're just getting it. You can just feel. Like, the energy is palpable. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's so hard to describe what that feels like, but you feel it. And you're totally getting this rush of energy from the audience. And you come off stage and you're like, wow, that something special happened tonight. Mm-hmm. And you can't describe it. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's this indescribable thing, but you just know that something magical just occurred. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because I'm remembering moments that I've had on stage where that has occurred. And... and it's one of those things that is just so difficult to put into words. But when you feel it, you know you're feeling it. Um, I had a really, actually, a really, really great experience last year on my practicum. I was working at uh, Templeton Secondary. And one of the first things that I did was uh, scene work with an acting 11-12 class. And in this class, I had three students with IEPs. Um, one was actually diagnosed on the autism spectrum and the two others had social emotional uh, learning issues on their IEPs and they were kind of put into this class as an experiment to see how possible theater work would would help them in, in an SEL context oh, yeah so I'm working with these three students and we got to the performance day and they performed and what they put on was actually amazing it wasn't anything that was going to go to Broadway, mm-hmm. but the work that they did, knowing the students and, and what they were capable of, and just the amount of growth that I saw over their rehearsal period up until the performance was was something spectacular. And when it was over, there was this one student, and, and he was like visibly shaking with a smile on his face. And I said to him, how are you feeling? And he's like, I don't know, but that was cool. Yeah. And I said, you're feeling this adrenaline rush, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah. And I said, and you want to perform again right now, don't you? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, that's it. That's yeah. that's what that's you've it. just done. You just created something magical and you're feeling it now. You've that's had, awesome. Yeah. yeah. He totally had a great response from the audience. They put on a comedic scene. Everybody was laughing. And, and he had this breakthrough. It was beautiful to see. And And... The, my host teacher was there, and and he's a very emotional person himself, and he was almost in tears for this student, like so happy for him. At the end of the day, can you put that into words? What happened? Well, no, you can't. You almost had to be in the room in order to fully grasp what had occurred in there. But something happened, and that student was a different student from that day forward. Right. Like it affected him in all of his classes. He was just a different person. Yeah, and and it's good to have that kind of. It's a different experience because uh, with any performance, like whether you're. Playing trumpet oh, or, for sure. or whatever dance. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. Anytime um, you're on stage in front of a live audience, you have the ability to make something happen. Right. Yeah. 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 That's why. Win. Yeah. That's why it's good to say yes to stuff like that. Hey, there you go. I mean, there's yeah. plenty of uh, there's lots of opportunities here, and I've seen students who aren't used to getting in front of an audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen students like that at like Thirty Hour Famine mm-hmm. or some of our talent shows, and you give them a little push, and they get out there and they're like, wow. This is, I did it. Yeah. Right. First of all. Yeah. And then, and then they they tend to want to do it again. Yeah. Because there's that that feeling of accomplishment, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
especially a live performance. And mm-hmm. you're, you're kind of, you've got the audience there supporting you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, and in a, in a really nice way, I got a lot of positive feedback from some teachers about the Remembrance Day assembly yeah. because of what the students did. Yeah. And coming to the school completely fresh and just asking students, okay, who wants to volunteer to be in the Remembrance Day assembly? And then, you know, I got a bunch of hands that went up and I basically said to myself, well, I'm not going to turn anybody down. So if you put your hand up, I'll find something for you to do. So then I had this collection of students and I basically just threw some text at them and said, let's have fun with this. Let's do something. And then the response that I got, and I, I was completely ignorant to a lot of these students' histories, but then to hear teachers coming up to me and saying, I had no idea that yeah. that student was capable of that. Yeah. And thinking to myself, wow, you know, I, I mean, I don't know where they were last year compared to where they are this year, but that was a, a magical thing for me to hear. Mm-hmm. And to know that I played a small part in that is, is wonderful, but for me, I'm, I'm really a lot more excited for that student and for the fact that they experienced that success. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. Just and that, to inter- reiterate, by the way, that was an amazing remembrance oh ceremony. thank you thank you the way and and the students like the way they read I, I haven't like we've had those kinds of performances before but a lot of the times it was you know what are they saying i can't i can't hear them um but i guess you you didn't choose them they they volunteered for them. well theater company this year is a class yeah and um we were i, I had i had taken on the remembrance day assembly very early on in the year because i love remembrance day i don't know why like it's like I know that it's a very somber event, but to me, it's such a meaningful event. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of my second favorite holiday after Christmas. I'm a big I love Christmas. Who doesn't, <laughs> right? And I mean, unless you belong to another religious culture, but there's always some special time of year for every creed and culture. But you know, Christmas is my favorite time of year. But second to that, I love Remembrance Day because I just think it's such a meaningful, important cultural day for us to remember those that made sacrifices for the world that we live in right now. And even though the world we're living in is a scary place, you know, when you think about historically what sacrifices were made, it could have been a lot worse. And um, I volunteered to take on Remembrance Day, and then all of a sudden Remembrance Day was two weeks away. (laughs) And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So I, I got together with my theater company, and I said... There's there's not going to be enough room for everybody because I got probably all in about 40 registered students wow. for theater company. And some of them are registered to be on the technical side, which is great. But, uh, you know, I, I without having the list in front of me, I think I have about 25 actors. And I'm thinking, okay, I can't possibly have 25 actors. And I'm sure that there will be some that don't want to do this. So I didn't want to make it for credit. But I thought, I'm going to offer it. Who here wants to read something at the Remembrance Day Assembly, and I had 13 hands go up, and I thought, that's a little bit higher than what I was expecting, but I think that's manageable. I think I can find something for 13 readers. And away I went. Well, I just thought it was very clear and expressive, and everything I'm glad, I'm glad, thank you. With that. Yeah, I was really, really proud of the students. Right. I mean, yeah. they're the ones that really pulled it together, yeah. and... Uh, my hat goes off to them. I think they were excellent. So, I mean, we have lots of opportunities for students to to show their stuff. And Absolutely. I think some of them sometimes just need a little bit of a push because I, I I know when I was in high school, I was an I, I'm still an introvert and I find that hard to believe. Yeah, yeah you find it hard to believe, but mm-hmm. I actually have to make an effort just to you know I put myself out there, you know, to do performances and things like that because you know I feel that I get something out of it, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Um, but it's not natural for me to do that. Do you, though, and I'm curious, and uh, sorry to interrupt you, but do you feel that being a teacher is a performer role? You're in front of an yes. audience of about 30 students yes. all day long. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, to me, that's a performer. I mean, yeah, yeah you're teaching them something, and you're giving them something, but at the same time, you, you're the performer. Maybe that's what I love about teaching. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's like preparing certain things and certain things to reveal at certain mm-hmm. times and um, coordinating the students as well. It's kind of changed a little bit for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. But When you're practicing but, a lot of inquiry too, which is right. really kind of dethroning the teacher and really right. putting the, the learning in the hands of the student, which is wonderful. Oh, yeah. But, you know, once in a while, you know, when it's time to do a lecture, mm-hmm. to do a demo or something like that, mm-hmm. totally, I, I prepare it. In the, in a way that it's uh, it's going to be magical for people, it, of course, <laughs> yeah. right? And 
you know, students really appreciate that. Yeah. Students really appreciate a teacher that takes the time to prepare something and 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 when they know that it's for the students. And the students can almost tell. It's like, who are you here for? Are you here for you or are you here for me? And when when the student knows you're there for them, mm-hmm. you, that's that's when you have them right in the palm of your hand. Well, with inquiry as well, it's I guess the magic is when they themselves discover something. Absolutely. So they, people, a lot of people think that inquiry, there's less structure, but in fact, it, you're structuring it so that they can make the discovery, mm-hmm. which is even way more magical than, than you, you know, it's, pulling it's, something out of your hat. It's the difference between <clears throat> scripted theater and improv. Right. You know, people think that there's no structure to improv, but there totally is. It's just a different kind of structure, and it's the same with inquiry. Versus the standing deliver teaching method and, and putting the the education in the hands of the students, it's like improv because the audience and the performer don't know what to expect, but there's going to be an outcome, and when they hit that outcome, something magical happens, and that's the that's the beauty of inquiry. Awesome. Do you have anything to plug or any uh, anything left to say? If you get me talking, I'm going to sit here all day. I know. But, I mean, this is our longest podcast so far. Really. What are we at right now, time-wise? We're episode two, and we're, I don't know, I, th- I think we've, like, done an hour. Holy smokes. Oh, yeah. I wonder if people are going to listen to the whole hour. I hope so. Oh, they will. Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, I could sit here and talk for days, but I, I understand that people have lives, and I, I my... Well, you, uh, you script... listen to part of the podcast. Yeah. You press pause. Yeah. And then you come back to it. Of later. course, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, my script writing directing students are actually directing a rehearsal right now, so I guess I can plug that show. Right now, our working title is Unknown. That's, that's the title. That's the actual that's title. That's the title, Unknown. Okay. And we think we're actually going to keep that title. Uh-huh. So the title of the play is Unknown. Mysterious. Um, it, and it is yeah. mysterious because the play itself is a mystery. So even though they, they – and it's kind of one of those things that's a happy accident because they didn't know what they were going to title it. So they just left the title as Unknown yes. on their working script because yeah. the software environment that they were using um, required a title to be written. Okay. So, so they wrote <laughs> Unknown. And when they printed it out, they kind of realized, actually, that's not a bad title for this play because it is a mystery. I like the idea of software as artist. I know. eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Um, software made us do it. Yeah, the software made us do it. it turned out pretty well. Yeah, so so a happy accident. So that's the kind of working title we're going with. And I've encouraged the writers to keep that as the title. Um, And what we're imagining, our our hope, and I apologize, I just need to get my calendar out here so I can remember the dates that we have uh, thought of. The play will go up in January, and our thought is that it will play on January 11th, 12th, and 13th, which is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, in January when we come back from the break. So if you're interested, uh, tickets will be uh, available at the door, of course. And Vancouver is very much, and I say Vancouver, meaning the Venture Vancouver area, is very much a don't buy tickets in advance kind of culture, which drives people nuts, especially when they put their whole budget into a show. But uh, typically people buy their tickets at the door. So I'll say right now the tickets will be available at the door. Uh, And at some point in time we'll figure out how advanced sales will work. But uh, keep your eyes out and your ears tuned for Unknown January 2016. Awesome. Thank you, Mark Turpin. No, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Kung. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Deborah. You're Deborah Dancer. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Have a great day, Delview. <laughs>